Hello, and welcome to the Complete History of Science, Series 4, Episode 1, On the Nature of Things. By the late 5th century AD, the Western Roman Empire was unravelling. Decades of invasions and civil disorder had greatly weakened the state, and in 476 AD, the last Western Emperor, Romulus Augustus, was deposed. A few years later, a barbarian named Theodoric established a new kingdom in Italy, on the carcass of the Roman Empire, with his reign marking the definitive split between the Eastern and Western Empires. While some of the governmental and social institutions of Rome persisted in the West, across the continent, the great empire was fracturing into smaller petty kingdoms. Many of the great cities became depopulated, and the average citizen faced increasing poverty. Weakening economic and social prospects also coincided with a noticeable decline in intellectual pursuits. During its prime, Rome boasted a robust educational system, where from a young age, the affluent received instruction in grammar, arithmetic and literature. This unapologetically practical course of study was followed by an intensive focus on rhetoric to prepare students for Roman public life. However, the most able and ambitious Romans could also embark on a more advanced program, working in Greek with a philosopher, who guided them through natural philosophy, geometry, astronomy and optics, preserving at least a version of scientific thought. Unfortunately, by the 6th century, this modest curriculum was disappearing in the West. The class of wealthy Romans who had supported this educational system lost the means to do so. Political partition also isolated the West culturally, cutting it off from the great seats of learning in Constantinople, Alexandria and Athens. This effect was amplified by the linguistic divide between the Latin-speaking West and the Greek-speaking East. Over time, fewer and fewer people in the West learned Greek, which was especially concerning as very few Greek works had ever been translated into Latin. The Romans had instead relied on their encyclopedias, which categorised Greek learning into seven subjects, known as the liberal arts. These encompassed the trivium, grammar, logic and rhetoric, and the more advanced mathematical quadrivium, music, arithmetic, geometry and astronomy. However, the encyclopedias only gave a condensed account of these subjects, which were frequently imprecise and even misleading. Romans, who had once greatly esteemed Greek learning, could no longer read the great works of astronomy, natural philosophy or medicine, and so were at risk of losing their intellectual heritage. Some people recognised this and became concerned. One of these was Boethius, a Roman senator living in the early 6th century, who served in Theodoric's court. Boethius, a Christian well versed in Greek learning, had himself received a classical education, but was now worried about the deteriorating educational system. To remedy this, Boethius set out on an ambitious translation program, aiming to translate the most important Greek work into Latin. Unfortunately, before he could make significant progress, Boethius found himself caught up in a plot against the Emperor Theodoric. He was arrested for treason, charged and eventually executed. He had completed a translation of Aristotle's logical work, and probably parts of Euclid's elements. But most texts remained untouched. This included Ptolemy's Almagest, the majority of the Galenic Corpus, and Aristotle's natural philosophy, all of which would be lost in the West. By the early Middle Ages, Western Europe had become an intellectual backwater. Between the 6th and 11th centuries, only the slimmest portion of antique knowledge persisted in the West. The question is, how did it survive at all, and how eventually 
did science thrive in Western Europe? Well, the simple answer is that it's largely thanks to the church. It's not too much of an exaggeration to claim that all the men who would contribute to the development of Western science during the Middle Ages were men of the church. This answer is surprising, particularly if we're familiar with the attitude of the early church towards so-called pagan knowledge. In the 2nd century AD, the early church father Terulian had denounced the study of Greek philosophy as a form of heresy, and his scornful outlook was common. In the 4th century, St. Basil questioned the value of philosophy, writing, The wise men of the Greeks wrote many works about nature, but not one account among them remained unaltered, and later accounts always overthrew preceding ones. Therefore, there's no need for us to refute their words, as they avail mutually for their own undoing. Of course, we would now consider this a strength rather than a weakness, but for the Church Fathers, the Bible stood as the ultimate guide to truth, and they had no need for the debates of Greek philosophy. Nevertheless, Greek thought would find its way into the Church. Partially, this was because many of the early Christian leaders had themselves received a classical education before their conversion and recognised that reason was a useful tool as they worked through their own theology. Some aspects of philosophy may have been suspect, particularly if they contradicted Christian teaching, but overall, as a programme, it was too valuable to completely discard. St Augustine, perhaps the most influential of the early church fathers, had his own doubts about philosophy, worrying that it could lead to what he called vain curiosity, and that it could take time away from spiritual activities. However, he took a pragmatic approach. Like many of his successors, he favoured a reasoned account of nature, rather than mystical explanations based on God's omnipotence. He argued that Christians could, and indeed should, make use of philosophy, especially where it might help us to better understand God. For example, he wrote a commentary on Genesis, which made use of natural philosophy to explain biblical creation. From the time of Augustine onwards, the Church would never have an entirely easy relationship with philosophy or science, but as the largest, most complex, and most meritocratic institution in the medieval world, it was also the only place capable of offering the material support which allowed learning to survive on a significant scale. One facet of this was the rise of the monastery. Around 500 AD, a young man called Benedict moved from Nursia in central Italy to Rome to pursue his studies. However, he found life in Rome spiritually unsatisfying, so he left to live as a hermit for three years, before joining several monastic communities. Benedict finally settled at Monte Cassino, in the mountains of central Italy, where he founded a monastery and established a set of rules for monastic life. These rules are an important part of our story because in addition to work and prayer, they mandated books and writing implements for all of the monks. These monasteries would also have a school attached which taught Latin and basic literacy. The curriculum was largely designed to meet the needs of the church with the ultimate goal of teaching young men to read the Bible. But as Benedictine monasteries spread across Europe, their rise would fill the void, left by the decline of traditional schooling. Despite the fact that most schooling provided by the church focused on the Bible, there is evidence that figures within the church continued to study natural philosophy. For example, Isidore, who in around 600 AD became the Bishop of Seville. Isidore was descended from a noble Roman family, but lived in the Iberian Peninsula, at a time where it was ruled by the Visigoths. He wrote a book called On the Nature of Things for Sisabut, the Visigothic king, with the intention of giving the king a broad account of the natural world according to ancient authorities. Isidore describes the four elements, fire, air, water and earth, 
as well as their associated properties. For example, Earth is dry and cold, while air is warm and wet. These ideas clearly derive from Aristotle, but interestingly, Isidore attributes them to St. Ambrose. This implies that Isidore wasn't working from Aristotle's original works, which were probably unavailable, but instead he was piecing together his account from various other sources. Most of his information likely came from the Latin encyclopedias, which he used as the model for his own work. He gives a basic summary of the cosmos, assuming an Aristotelian system of concentric spheres around the Earth, ordering them, starting with the Moon, followed by Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. In addition, he properly describes eclipses, night and day, and the phases of the Moon. However, there's also a notable distinction between Isidore's work and the Latin encyclopedists. Whereas the encyclopedists concentrated on a description of nature, Isidore placed much greater weight on symbolism. For instance, he accurately describes the phases of the Moon, as a result of their position relative to the Sun. But he also writes that the waning of the Moon symbolises death and the retreat of time, while its reappearance symbolises the eternity of the soul. Isidore's blending of ancient learning and Christian doctrine is characteristic of the early Middle Ages. During this period, nature was rarely observed impartially, but instead was imbued with moral or religious significance. Isidore was influential, and a century later, Bede, a monk in Tynemouth, Northern England, wrote his own encyclopedia, also called On the Nature of Things. In it, he follows a similar structure to Isidore, describing a wide range of natural phenomena and giving explanations derived from ancient authors. Bede's version describes almost exactly the same phenomena, such as the phases of the moon, eclipses, the order of the planets, and the four elements, though Bede's account is slightly more rigorous than Isidore. He included, for example, a description of the severity of the earth, demonstrating unambiguously that the most learned men in medieval society didn't believe in a flat earth. Bede's other work was on timekeeping, and he described the various calendar systems, as well as their relationship to the cycles of the moon and sun. This work was particularly important to the church, because it needed to predict the date of Easter, the most important Christian feast, well in advance. This was so that several months of observances could be scheduled in preparation. Easter, as you may know, falls on the first Sunday after the full moon, after the vernal equinox. Bede could calculate the dates of the full moons, but was unsure of the precise date of the equinox, so relied on the traditional date provided by the Eastern Church. This was despite the fact that Bede quoted Pliny, who discussed the use of the nomon to measure the equinox. However, Bede doesn't seem to have made his own observations, demonstrating how the habit of observation was often absent during this period. Isidore and Bede, then, didn't make any great scientific advances. Instead, they merely preserved and restated some modest version of ancient learning. If the history of science is simply a record of the great discoveries and advances, they would deserve no place in it. But if we also want to understand how we came to our present moment, Isidore and Bede are important for several reasons. Firstly, the careers of Isidore and Bede underline the remarkable role which the Church played in preserving knowledge. The Church was the most important institution in the medieval world. It connected people across the continent and provided a common language. While many Romance languages were spoken, the Bible and the liturgy were always in Latin, and Latin would act as the lingua franca. This allowed a network of travelling monks to carry books and ideas between monasteries across the continent. 
It's no coincidence, I think, that both Bede and Isidore called their work On the Nature of Things. The church also provided a shared identity, and while people may be subjects of a particular king or country, they could also identify as part of a greater polity, Christendom, which stretched across all of Europe. Isidore and Bede also demonstrate that the study of nature never disappeared entirely. While they didn't make their own observations, they still cared enough to preserve and disseminate what they knew about the natural world. The Latins may have been far behind the ancient Greeks or their contemporaries in the Islamic world, but even during this nadir of scientific thinking, something survived. Isidore and Bede, then, provide the background against which the rest of our story takes place. And what a story it is. Beginning in the 12th century, Europe would transform itself at an astonishing rate. By the 17th century, the West was undisputedly far in advance of the rest of the world, in science, mathematics and technology. How did this happen? How did this backwater, this tiny peninsula, on the edge of the Eurasian continent, come to lead the world? These questions will take the rest of the podcast to answer. However, that's all we have time for in today's episode. Thank you for listening, and an especial thank you to everybody who's been rating the podcast on Apple and Spotify. It means a lot to me that people enjoy the show. If you have any questions or comments, please get in touch. Until next time.